This episode is brought to you by Naval and his groundbreaking quote, Self-esteem is a reputation that you have with yourself. <laughs> Welcome to the Stefan Dyer Podcast, my people. Hello, my people. Go stand out, caballeros. Welcome to the Stefan Dyer podcast, where I welcome people with remarkable stories for amazingly vulnerable conversations, ladies and gentlemen. I am Stefan Dyer, former banker turned comedian and lifestyle entrepreneur. And today, my friends, I have Jimmy Bataglia with me. We're trying something new today because for the first time ever. In the history of the podcast, I'm recording this introduction live in front of Jimmy. We're trying something new. We'll see how it goes. And you might be wondering, well, why are you doing this? Well, we're just trying new stuff. So I'm going to say Jimmy's bio, like you're always used to. And I'm going to say why I invited him. And then he's going to pretend like, oh, my God, this is incredible. I've never heard it. Well, you obviously, he sent me his bio, but we're going to make it extremely exciting. Okay. Jimmy Bataglia is a father, a husband, entrepreneur, and NFT enthusiast. He has over 15 years of experience in sales and marketing, highly specialized in the international education industry. How incredible is that? Now that je that's just the tip of the iceberg, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to tell you why I invited Jimmy and what fascinates me about Jimmy. We started our friendship around seven years ago. And only got really close until I think the last few years. I really admire Jimmy because of his kindness, willingness to help, vulnerability, and especially his curiosity. Jimmy is always learning. I think that's something that we have in common. He's actually been instrumental in my personal growth. As I prepared this introduction, I, I realized, wow, Jimmy has actually recommended like my favorite, my favorite books that I always quote on the podcast. Jimmy recommended. The 4-Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss, and The E-Myth by Michael E. Gerber, both of which have been instrumental in my personal and entrepreneurial journey. And I remember Jimmy said, hey, if you read them together, that's really good. And the, the, those two books were on my list for like two years until I finally got them, and now I can't stop talking about them. In 2019, so we'll talk about entrepreneurship for sure. Secondly, in 2019, Jimmy hosted a small session where he helped us, a group of friends, understand our top strengths based on the Gallup report, Strengths Finder, which we'll include in the show notes so that you can do your own Strengths Finder, which blew my mind because for the first time ever, I understood every strength has its weakness. And you may be thinking, what do you mean? What, what, what do you mean every strength has its weakness? Well, we'll also talk about that today. And finally, a couple weeks ago, my wife, uh, Liam, and I went over to have dinner at Jimmy's place, at Jimmy and Ana Karina's place, and Jimmy introduced us to the fascinating new world of NFTs. You may be thinking, well, I don't care, it's irrelevant, I'm never going to buy one, these things are overpriced, losers buy NFTs. Well, you are wrong, <laughs> because <laughs> like Jimmy says, it's the future. We'll talk about it in a, in a way that's fun and captivating, and you'll get it because I still don't understand NFTs very well. So we're going to talk about that, the blockchain, all these complicated things that we don't understand, and Jimmy's going to uh, really help us see what's coming in the years ahead. If you like this episode, don't forget, share it, share the positive stuff, give us a review. We love the five stars. Screenshot it. This is my uh, screenshot it on your Instagram stories. And tag us at Stefan Dyer and at Jimmy Bataglia with a double T. Also, I've been saying this for the past like six episodes. You can now watch the episode video on Spotify video podcasts. So if you're listening to it on Spotify, you can also watch it. Oh, you Also, you can watch it on YouTube and you can listen to it on audio on all the other platforms. Shout out to Carlos Bolivar for his amazing editing skills. And now, ladies and gentlemen... He's a brilliant entrepreneur, education industry expert, NFT enthusiast, 
Please welcome the unbreakable, the unmistakable, the highly capable Jimmy <laughs> Bataglia, ladies and gentlemen. How are you, brother? Very good, man. Very good. I need to take that clip, and every time I'm going to introduce myself, we're just going to play it. That's, <laughs> that's actually amazing. So, really well put. I, uh, I thoroughly enjoy I woke up today at 5.30, and I'm like, you know what? The biggest bottleneck that I have in terms of my relationship with Carlos Bolivar, our editor... Is that I take the longest time to send him the intro piece of each episode. So I'm like, why don't I do the intro live? The person gets to hear it, which is really cool because they get to see why I admire them. And I save so much time and mental hassle of not having sent this to Carlos Bolivar. <laughs> so Carlos is like, Oye, no me has mandado la foto ni la introducción. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Carlos, done, sorry, right? sorry, sorry. We're good. We're good. This was pretty good. I think it was pretty good. Jimmy, my friend. Oh, my God. Because we already did the intro, why I invited you, how did we meet? I think we can jump into the first topic of today, which is entrepreneurship. You've been instrumental in my journey because I was doing lots of things that the E-Myth book talks about. And I think a lot of people are going to learn. And the e-myth, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the way I explain it. But I've always explained it without the person who uh, recommended the e-myth. So the e-myth means it's a book. It's all actually ranked the number one small business book in the world, I think. And the e-myth stands for the entrepreneurial myth, which means that People think that because they can do the technical job, for example, bake pies, that they should start a bakery. But that's a myth because the skill set required to do the technical job, which could be doing the pie, baking the pies, or coding, or writing credits at a bank, is not the same skill that is required to run a business that bakes pies. So the skill set, the technical skill set to bake a pie is not the same skill set as the managerial skill set to run a business that bakes pies. So what happens is fast forward three years, people end up hating their lives because they have to run a business and now they don't get to do what they loved initially, which is bake the pie. And then the, the book further, I mean, it's a glorious book. You should read it, especially if you're an entrepreneur, but it basically says that you have three main skills. The technical one, which is doing baking the pie, the managerial, which is running the bakery, which is the present, and the entrepreneurial one, where it's ideas looking towards the future. And it is very rare where one person will have the three skills very strong. That's right. Did I miss anything? <laughs> No, no, and I have to say, I read that book years ago, so you have it way fresher than I have, but I think the, the key idea of that, and I think if you, know, if you were to simplify it, is that you know, most um, businesses fail, and, yeah. and many people don't understand you know, why so many businesses fail, but it's, it often doesn't have to do with the idea or the product, because many people start a business you know, doing what they love to do in terms of the technical way. But they really don't oversee all the challenges of starting a new business, right? Both, you know, like financially and just running the business, doing advertising, drawing and operations and so on. So uh, when you're doing what you love, you enjoy that part. You want to keep doing that part. But you won't get clients if you don't, you know, but first you won't get a bank account if you don't open a company, right? You need to run accounting. You need to run financials. You need to run marketing. You need to run so many other things. But normally, because you don't know about those things or those things scares you, you just leave it to the side. So you yeah. keep doing what you love. So what often happens is that, um, with the example of the cake, is that you do one cake. So many people maybe want to buy your cakes, uh, but you don't have a system in place to take the orders. Yeah. You don't have you know, anything regarding operations. So you just take one a day, let's say. So at the end of the day, when you check your financials, at best, you have a self-employment. At best, you yeah. maybe get a regular salary, but you didn't start a business. You just self-employ yourself. And if you're happy and, you know, that's enough money for what you want to do, that's fine. But most yeah. people think about financial independence. They think about all the good things about growing a business. They dream about having bakers all over the city and things like that. But that won't happen if you don't do the business side. So people the scaling. Just, yeah, the scaling side, which is the most difficult part. So people just burn out, right? They burn out and then they ended up sometimes even hating doing the cakes because maybe they got 10 orders and they, they, they haven't slept for a few days. And then yeah. they, 
uh, where it shouldn't be them, if they love doing the case, it shouldn't be them doing the other stuff. I mean, they need to put it in place, they need to understand it, they know how to run it or see it, um, but it shouldn't be them doing uh, absolutely everything, if you're building a business, not a self-employment. I love that. Especially at the beginning of every entrepreneurial journey, you are what we call in Spanish, un todero. No, yeah. as is todo. You do everything. Yeah. And the problem with that it w is really good because the book says, okay, it, we understand you have to do everything. But if you don't document it, it's impossible for you to delegate it. That's right. And then what ends up happening is you delegate it, but you're micromanaging the other person because you want them to do the same. You want them to do what you did the same exact way that you did it. So now you're still doing two jobs without having the two jobs. <laughs> exactly. And then you're angry because they don't do it the way. So documenting is a critical part of being able to delegate. But let's rewind a little bit. So you were born in Venezuela. You came to Canada to learn English. And then you started working years after you started learning English in ILEC, where you were a director in marketing in your last role, right? You had to travel a lot. And what did you learn from this role that you took to your next roles as an entrepreneur? Um, you mentioned something that uh, is that I've been very curious, right? Mm -hmm. So um, when I was a student, um, I, I finished studying English, and then I was offered some internships at ILAC, uh, which is a company that I work uh, with. Uh, An English school in Canada. The English school, yeah. So I, I was an intern in in marketing, the marketing department. Um, and funny enough, my last job there was the, the head of marketing, and then I was moving to sales. Uh, but because I'm always curious, I always want to know about the business. So then I understood, uh, understood the business, understood the industry, and then I say, well, but why there are not systems that do this and that? You know, why? I mean, it starts always seeing the empty spaces everywhere yeah. I go. They always go like, oh, but it will be great if this exists, right? Yeah. Um, so I, that's a, I mean, as I kept working, I mean, I graduated, I worked from, a, from, from the agency side briefly, like part-time. Then I went back to, to ILAC. I did a recruitment in Latin America. I used to travel like six months a year. Um, and then every time I go, I'm, that's a kind of like a status I'm always, you know, like I'm always seeing, you know, this is missing, this is missing, but there is a key part. Yeah. I wanted to. I needed my job. I mean, I love my job, but I also needed it to get my permanent residence and do my paper. So I always said, you know what? I cannot start this right now. I need this job because, you know, starting at your own business is not as it's easy to qualify. It's kind of as an immigrant and, uh, yeah, and to qualify and to be able to stay. Exactly. I mean, my, my back then, that program that I apply, I mean, now there are so many different programs, but that was really tied to having a job in a position that I had. And, you know, the company needed to qualify in certain ways that I couldn't qualify with a company that I would build myself, right? So um, I never did it. And it's funny because I've seen companies that are valued in billions of dollars today of ideas that I saw back then that they were missing. So... Um, like what? Um, what kinds of ideas? Uh, eh, well, Having your own private driver picking you up a <laughs> Uber... Renting out places, no, Airbnb. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I think uh, those ideas uh, is more about things related with the education industry, right? Oh, okay. Um, the way they connect, like the way they send applications, the way they... No, it's more about operational things that happen in the oh, industry. Okay. Many people don't know, but this is uh, like a $150 billion industry. And wow. In Canada, it's the second lar you know, largest export if you measure international education as, a, as an know. export product. Yeah, it's, 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 it's crazy. Just after mining, you know, it's a second because the students they bring over fourteen billion dollars every year to Canada. This money is coming from outside the country to Canada, so that really adds to the GDP of like UK, Canada, Australia. These countries that bring lots of students is is crazy. The industry is enormous. Wow. Um. So well, I, I start seeing things that were missing, especially in terms of technology. You know, education hasn't changed in like. I don't know how many hundred years. Um, and then from the technology side of doing things, they're normally uh, behind, you know, like at least if you compare it with um, travel, um, travel, there are things in travel that um, were there 10 years ago that the international education industry is just exploring, you know, trying to get in, wow. right? In terms of how they manage information, pricing, quotations, and so on. So um, there are many of those things that I saw back then, you know, I, I, I love traveling. So I also explore that industry as well. Yeah. And then, but I never took action. So um, I only took action after a point where I said, you know what, 
uh, I, this is the moment. I, I was the head of um, marketing at the company and they offered me the head of sales, which was a position that didn't exist back then. Uh, the, the owner had it, so they offered it to me. And I said, if I take this, it's because I'm going to dedicate, you know, my next five years into, you know, learning and yeah. doing everything and putting my heart. I, I don't I don't know how to work nine to five. I always work like, you know, <laughs> I live my I life in, my, in the things that I do. So uh, I decided, you know, this is the time I talked to my wife. She supported me. And, and then I, I went on just starting my own thing. And well, when you when you started your first company after I left, what? were the immediate challenges that you had that you didn't expect? Um, well, I mean, I think you have to do more with, um, you have an idea, you're very excited about it, and you don't take in consideration all the, um, the mental health status that you need to have to be able to just go from managing a team of like 15 people and working with, people all the time to just be in your in your office in your house you know uh, alone just building something also um uh, not having accountability partners back then was a problem because you can do you can be busy all day without getting to certain yeah. things right or, or you get to the point where you want to feel busy but you're necessarily having the traction that you need to get to to take the business forward so uh yeah there are so many challenges i mean challenges we can spend uh <laughs> Five episodes talking about yeah. challenges of starting your own business. Okay, I think one of the best things that, that, that I learned from you through these books as well is that people who have accomplished great things in life, in startups, in business, do them do so by double downing on their strengths and not necessarily mitigating their weaknesses. Well, I've studied a lot, a lot of years, high performers, and people who have accomplished great things. And yes, they, they mitigate certain weaknesses to be able to perform at a high level. But they identify their strengths to be able to really, really double down on them. And I think when it comes to a, a startup, when it comes to being on, an entrepreneur, this is critical because you don't want to be dealing with things that you're super bad at. Like, for example, I, I, I love design, you know, and, and Huang in our business used to, he's an industrial designer and a graphic designer. So he does all the graphic design, but I really feel passionate about design. I love design. So I, I joined a course on like uh, Coursera or Udemy. I don't remember. And I started learning graphic design, you know, and, I was like so passionate and after like six months, what I could do was like crop a picture of a person <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, dude, I love design, but this isn't for me, you know, I might as well delegate it. And even if, even if, uh, Huang, like even for Huang, it doesn't make sense to be doing graphic design because he's a seat, like he's a, he's an owner and his hour is worth more time than doing crops and, and, and building flyers that you could delegate or hire someone at Upwork or Fiber that could do it for, for less less money, you know? But going back to entrepreneurship and transitioning into the Gallup report, how did you, what are your strengths and how have you really been able to double down on them when it comes to your your companies? Yeah, you mentioned something important there is that some, some people think that you need to be great at everything in your business uh -huh. and it's not true. I mean, it... it if you try to do that, you're going to burn out for yeah. sure. And what's going to happen is that you will have to do, I don't know, some accounting. And it happened to me a hundred times. I hate everything regarding with accounting, <laughs> right? Uh, and what's going to happen is that first you're going to, um, every time you're going to start that, you're going to drive, you're going to go into your Instagram, you're going to do things. And those are triggers, right? That that get you to, and that's it. And I think To procrastinate. Uh, yeah. And that, not do the, the There's thing. one of the books, uh, I don't know if the power of habit or what, but they talk about the, the, triggers. You know, the triggers, right? Yeah, so the power of habit. You, you get to, uh, and then when you get to it, because, you know, you need to submit something, you need to do it, then it's going to take you 10 times the time that would take another person. So all the time that you spend, <laughs> yes. uh, you could have paid that person. So I learned that, I mean, the, 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 the strength finder, I think that's something that everybody should be doing um the um, so just for context the strength finder is called the gallup report you can google it and jimmy explained this to me that everybody has 34 strengths but for the 20 bucks the the initial test they give you your top five strengths 
And you feel like you've been spied because they describe you perfectly based on a series of questions that you have to answer. I think it's like over 30 questions that you have to answer. It takes like 10 to 15 minutes to really fill, answer all these questions, multiple choice. And then they give you your top five strengths. So go ahead. Yeah, so I mean that that's a tool and it's a fantastic tool. I recommend anyone to do it, and I know many jobs they they ask you to do it because they want to learn a little bit more about you. But I think the the key part there is uh, identifying yourself because sometimes you think, no, I'm not I'm not bad at that, or I'm not, you know, it's good that it's something that more you know rationally explains you validates where your, exactly yeah. where your uh, strengths are um, and that your top strengths because we all have a little bit of. All of the 34, right? Yeah. You just have it in certain degrees. I mean, it doesn't mean the one that is on the 34 is a, is a weakness. No, that's a still a strength. It's just yeah. you have it in lesser degrees. So you want to focus on the ones that are in the in the top uh, part of it. Um, so I, 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 one example that happened to me just in the practical way of talking about this, and then we'll go back to the strength, is that um, uh, the system that they were using at the company I was working at, uh, to, to do reports was horrible. So I have to export Excel. I have to run through like, I'm, again, I'm horrible at all that. So I had <laughs> to learn Excel, right? I have to sit down with someone from accounting, literally record his screen of how he was doing <laughs> things and do it a hundred times, right? So it will take me like two hours to get a sales report that I needed to do to make some decisions. Um, then I, I had this intern, uh, um, Effie, she's amazing. I, I, I almost cried when she, when she left. Um, because he was going to study something, but she will do it in like in 20 minutes and she created a macro where I just click and press a button and the wow. thing will calculate everything for me. So why would I spend two hours of my time managing a, a team, you know, traveling six months a, a year, if I can find someone, an intern that could do it in 20 minutes, right? Yeah. And that's, I mean, there's, she has strengths in that area. That's not my strength. So I think it's important to identify really. Um, and then I have the peace of mind. I need a report. I just, you know, contact this person. Yeah. They get it done. So I don't have the stress of I need to do it. I need to finish it because I need to make decisions. You just find people. And yeah, I mean, hey, the only way, I mean, if you're starting a business, you say, oh, but I, ha I don't have money um, for doing that. You need to calculate how much of your own time was the value of your time. Definitely. So at the end of the day, you, you may think I don't want to pay. But if it took five hours, that you could be just baking cakes or you could be talking to customers. Um, then, you know, if you put money to your time, which you always should, uh, then Definitely. you're going to figure out that it's better just to pay someone. That's, I think this is a critical, critical concept because a lot of people, including, <laughs> including myself and Juan at the beginning, were like, oh, well, let's just use cakes for the, for the example. Oh, I sold 10 cakes and I made $100. So my profit is $100. Yeah. But it's not it's not a hundred dollars because because you have to subtract okay the basic cost okay let's call it like everything you had to buy to bake the cakes the ten cakes was like twenty bucks so you may be thinking oh I got a hundred dollars in revenue plus minus twenty dollars that it cost me to buy all the ingredients so my profit a lot of people think it's eighty dollars but it's not because you have to attach a time value to the time that you're investing. So what ends up happening is that people are like, well, I, my profit is $80. But no, you have to pay yourself or at least account for the time that you're investing in yourself because otherwise you're never going to be able to delegate that role ever. And you're never going to be able to scale and have two bakeries or, or, or three staff. So at least put a symbolic wage to the time. So for example, if it took you five hours to bake the 10 cakes, just as a symbolic thing, say, okay, my my hour is worth $10. So, okay, $100 of revenue minus $20 at the incre ingredients cost. My gross profit is $80 minus the wages, the, the cost of labor, which in this case we just said is $50. So my net profit is $80 minus 50, so it's $30. You have to attach some sort of value to the time that you're investing. And if you want to take it further, for example, in my case, I I say that my hour is worth $250. So if there's anything that that I have to fix around the house that is that is going to take me one hour, and it's not that critical that cost less than $250, I'm just going to ignore it. Or if hiring someone, that hiring them is less than my hour, 
I'm going to outsource it too because I could spend my hour selling, calling clients, uh, getting personal like one-on-one clients and that's going to make me $2,000 or that's going to make me $5,000 for a big corporate event. So I might as well delegate free up time so that I can use that time to be able to make more money and therefore pay the people to do the stuff that I'm not good at. Yeah. And that's how you scale. Done. Okay, the podcast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't apply. You need to do the dishes, right? You cannot go get away no, 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 <laughs> by saying my, my time is $250. <laughs> yeah. Not the dishes. Not the dishes. But no. but even then, like, you could get a dishwasher, you know? You could get, like, for example, I've talked this with my wife. Like, like cleaning the house is, like, four hours where the chemicals that you use, like, will give me asthma. For the four hours, I'm miserable. Like I'm, in, it's not just my four hours; it's also my wife's four hours, and it's Liam that we that is we're not with him for those four hours. So there is a, there is a cost to that. So what if I spend a hundred and twenty dollars to hire someone to come and clean the house? Which, by the way, because they do this for a living, they're going to clean it better than we do, and then I free up not just my four hours but her four hours. That's eight hours of our time, and I'm not miserable. I don't have asthma. I'm in a good mood. I can go spend it with friends. The thing is, people say, oh, I don't have time to do yoga. I, you know how much I would pay to have two free hours for myself a week? Yeah, you don't have those two free hours because you're spending eight hours a week on TikTok, 11 hours a week on Instagram. Like you're doing lots of things that don't need, you're, you're spending like reading Twitter that makes you angry. You watch the news four hours a week. You watch TV. You watch like 20 hours of Netflix. That's why you don't have time. So, yeah, yeah. so documenting is very important. Okay. My, my rant is, is done here, but. Again, back to the strengths. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah, just one, one thing to finalize that. I, I think because my, my wife has a small business as well, and I see this every single day. Mm-hmm. Um, when when doing that, and just going back to the example of the cake, because that makes it easy, you know, to adapt it to different businesses, is that um, many people, by doing that, this is like, oh, well, I have $30. I didn't have $30, so now I have them. But uh, many people, they really ended up paying themselves, even if they you know, less than a minimum salary. So at the end of the day, when you're pricing stuff and then you, you just yeah. sell it and you take your costs and everything, even if you pay yourself a minimum salary, some people are left with a negative uh, number. Exactly. So that have to do also with pricing, which is a whole different conversation. But they, what many small businesses fail at is also pricing their products because they say, you know what? So true. My, I, I, you know, I, I spent five hours, but you know, I was doing nothing. No, no, no. Those are five hours that if you spend it in McDonald's, you will have working at McDonald's, you will have a uh, hundred dollars right now. Now you have 20. So, I mean, did you really make so a profit? That, I mean, uh, how, how much do you like that to be able to be spending, you know, less than a minimum salary on doing that? So it's impossible to build a business. Like that. But that's, I mean, we can talk about <laughs> that kind of things. <laughs> the, in the no, but it's, it's critical. And I think on the topic of entrepreneurship and the mistakes that we all do, we did them with Juan at the beginning, which is, and I think because we're both Latinos and, and newcomers, immigrants, this could help a lot of people. And it's the, the pricing. Cause, it's uh, an art. Is, yeah, it's an, it's an art. And it's also, it takes a lot of courage because my, my view at the beginning was, well, I work at a bank. I don't need this money. I'm just going to price it super cheap. And I'll give you the example of the public speaking through comedy course that we started five years ago, which you took. You were one of the first groups. Yeah. We used to price it at $250 for pretty much like 25 hours of class, more, 30 that we dedicated, twice of us teaching the course, so 60 hours. Mm -hmm. And we, we we probably got eight people to join the course. That's $2,000 in revenue. $2,000 divided by 60 hours that we invested in it. It's $33 an hour, but it was, it was like way more than that. Okay. So $250, but our, our, uh, preparation, everything, pre- there's preparation, the, the, place, the, like- the grad show there's going, we, we used to provide like a seventh and an eighth class that we went to people's houses and, 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 uh, rehearsed. Yeah. Then I do, I did like a one hour or two hour session with each student so that they felt extra, extra, extra prepared. So we ended up getting like less than minimum wage. And 
the thing that is most important was the reasoning behind the 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 two hundred and fifty dollars because we were like, well, well, who is the company that is the the market reference? It's the second city. How much do they charge? And we we're like, well, they charge three hundred and forty dollars or three hundred dollars, I think, at that time. And we're like, well, we're not gonna charge three hundred dollars because we're not the second city for the same course, similar course, you know. And we're like, well, we're gonna charge two fifty then. But then, the second city only offers like the six classes, and there's you go, you leave, and that's it. You don't ever talk to the teachers again. That's all they they offer, you know. And there's no additional. We would spend so many hours into it. So based on that, we're like, we can't we can't charge more than three hundred dollars. But then we started realizing we're really good at this, and if we want to be able to grow. Like we can't, we can't just continue charging two hundred and fifty dollars for the rest and of time. And you had a niche market. I mean, you had a Spanish. You you guys yeah. opened the this this concept and this, uh, you know, uh, yeah, this yeah this concept in the city. I mean, they were, I, I don't know any other no, yeah, like, Spanish it, speaking. You know, it was training niche. here. And then the the thing, the other thing was like they would, the I don't know if it's just Latinos, but the Latinos were the ones that would offer uh, ask for discount. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> would be like, no, nah, this is too expensive. And then sometimes Canadians will. I know I understand that Latinos are newcomers and maybe they have less income, but the Canadians would just be like, of course, and no questions asked. And now that we charge four hundred and fifty, people are more grateful. They pay more. We sell more. It's almost as if you charge more, people assume that the product is better. In many yeah, ways. no, no, it's, they don't assume. I mean, that that's a true reality, and that's a. You know, when, when I was studying marketing years ago, they, they talk about the, you know, promotion price. I mean, they, that's part of the marketing mix, what they call, and that really talks about the product. I mean, sometimes they have nothing to do. The same material, say, same quality, and two products uh, sell a different price, but how do you market yourself is important, and that needs to be reflected in the product. If you tell me your training costs $20, I'm not going to take it. I'm going to be like, ah, <laughs> man, maybe something's told from YouTube, right? It's just uh, rephrasing it. So I think the pricing is important. But just going back to the, the small businesses, um, I mean, I... It, it should be a marketing strategy to start with a price point because you need to launch, right? So you yeah. need to have some people, but it needs to be thought as a marketing strategy, understanding you're investing that money. So I'm, I'm instead of paying my, myself $60, I'm going to spend 30 of those $60 into marketing. And therefore, I'm going to reduce the price as a way to get this started and get uh, testimonials and get it going. Yeah. But always understand if you start selling your products for a period of time at that price, that people is going to refer people that can only afford that price. And then so getting key. out of that loop is almost impossible. I mean, and then, you know, if you want to increase your price, then these people are going to stop buying you. And now you're depending on from that market that you have. And that happened to so, us. So, yeah. So it, it's, it's, um, it's a loop that is really hard to get out. But if you start in a business, it's okay. You know, build portfolio, build some clientele, get the word out there. But try to get out of that as soon as you can. Otherwise, you're going to be in big trouble. Yeah. And this is for a small business. I mean, I have nothing to do with startup, which is what I do. But I, 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 I helped my wife to build her business. And I saw that happening and still happening to, to many businesses. So, yeah. Yeah, that exactly. I hadn't thought about it. That happened to us because we were to 300, from 250 to 300. And people were like, no, but you used to do 250. Yeah. And we're like, well, now we don't. Well, can you do 250? And because we were starving, we didn't have money. We quit our jobs. Yeah. We're like, okay, give me 250. Ah, but can I pay you in 16 installments? And we're like, okay, man. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. maybe no, but that's why you need to because you were getting referred by you know people that pay that 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 price point. But then if you know that you know the Canadian market pays different, then you need to focus on that, and then they will refer you to people that can afford it too. Yeah. You know? like, so yeah. my biggest fear, and maybe you can help us with with this. My biggest fear at the time, and I'll tell you how I deal with it now, is that people will be like, "That's too expensive for what for what you offer." I'm not going to take it. And then what I do now is something that our coach, uh, our business coach, Cody, uh, taught us. And it's very simple. You have to be prepared to walk away. It's very hard when you don't have money because you just quit your job like we did five years ago. Yeah. But you have to prepare to walk away. And typically they come back. But what I use now is the following. Is no, I understand. And uh, I understand that you think this is very expensive. 
And I understand that this may not be a good fit right now based yep. on your budget. And that this may not be a good fit is my signature line now. This may not be a good fit. And I hope that we can work together in the future yep. if the budget you know, is, is a better fit next time. Perfect. This is perfect and, and people people don't know what to say because they're like, oh, okay, I'll take it. Or they're like, well, I'm not going to take it. But then like six months later, they come back because they hired someone who was cheaper that didn't live up to the expectations. Yep, exactly. So I, I think that's something that all small <laughs> businesses should hear, man. Like really, because what normally happens... That's what it should happen. What yeah. normally happens is that, you know, yeah, I mean, this this costs uh, fifteen hundred dollars, right? So the the client says, "Oh man, I have a hundred. Then okay, I'll take it. I mean, the, yeah. that's I'll take it. Uh, it's gonna take you to uh, you know a place you don't want to be. If you really want to build a business and not a self employment, and many people lose money uh, uh, by accepting those things. But you need to be so confident to get to that point and also you know get your finances right some people really yeah. need it to get to the end of the month but you need you need to get your finances right so you can actually get out of that uh, loophole yeah and the key the key to what we're just talking about i think is that if you're just thinking about the short term you're going to take any money yeah. but you got to think about the long term the sustainability of your business if you're always and you know what people talk because you're like jamie yeah I charge fifteen hundred, but I'll take eight hundred this time. But just between us, okay? Bullshit. People talk to each other, and I've had so many corporate clients that don't, e that didn't even, I didn't even know they knew each other, and especially referrals. And they're like, I'm like, well, it's eighteen hundred. You're like, no, but you, you, you charged thirteen hundred to the other client last year, and I'm like, how did you, how did you yeah. know that? Yeah. And then I'm like, listen. After this is another one that I use after after extensive market research and understanding the value that we provide, we have increased our fees to reflect the quality of the service. Yeah. And and then yeah, but uh, well, listen, I know it may not be a good fit this time around, but if uh, in the future you want to work together and the budget is right, uh, I look forward to working with you. And they're like, ah, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. It's uh, that's the way. And you you should have. I mean, some some. Things of negotiation where you add more value but you don't decrease the price. I mean, there's so many different ways to to, to close the deal, right? Yeah. Still making them feel that they got something extra because there's some you know uh, some dynamic in sales that you need to to have. But definitely not decreasing your price. I mean, add more value, add uh, find other ways, but do not decrease your price. That's gonna kill your your business. And yeah, yeah. And there's there's cases. For example, if we've had an example where we're like, well, this kind of product for this amount of people and this length is 5,000, for example. And they're like, sorry, sorry, Stefan, we only have uh, 4,200. This is a fixed budget. And we were, we were going to provide an hour. But to be able to make it work, we're like, we'll take the 4,200, but we can't provide an hour. We'll provide 45 minutes. Yep. So that's that's one way to... But you don't decrease wiggle. the price of your... I mean, you exactly. really just adapt it. And that happens. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, in my business, it doesn't happen that often, but they, I I see it in my wife's business, right? Where that happens. Like, yeah, I mean, I want to make a party and I want to do like 100 things, right? So, okay, that can go to $10,000. So, oh, but I only have 8000 That's great. We want to make something amazing. <laughs> but, you know, don't spec the, the, the 15 foot garland and a hundred other things maybe you know what let's keep that but let's just not have 500 balloons let's have 300 and then we put it's gonna be amazing it's gonna be beautiful yeah. and so on it's gonna adapt to your budget but we're not gonna give you the same thing that i told you costed ten thousand dollars for if your budget is eight thousand it just won't you know yeah won't happen and that that works i mean that that's what makes it uh, sustainable i mean when my wife and so proud of her she just walked out of her of um of her house which was full of balloons and now she's having her store and this is challenging and there's so much you know financial commitment we put into it um yeah, but it's huge, a way of evolving to to that and yeah. huge shout out follow ak balloons on instagram in fact fun fact we were the first ones ever that's true to have the AK Balloons experience, Jimmy and Karina, this was December 2017 or 18. I don't know. December 2018. 18 because yep. we were in this apartment, in the old apartment. It was Narissa's birthday, December 16, 2018. Yeah. And you guys were launching this and you wanted to practice a little bit and I, I wanted to surprise Narissa. So... We went to Lisbeth Herrera's cottage in uh, Turkey Point. Yeah. And while we were there for a day or two, you guys sneaked into my house. 
and you had a beautiful balloon array arrangement that said happy birthday and uh, so happy to be part of that journey man. yeah man yeah yeah you, that's it's true like that's true and later. you help us uh, starting at uh, the instagram and everything because you know you posted and uh, were yeah. some of the, the first followers and then yeah yeah how many followers does ak balloons have now um over like i think sixty thousand. Wow. uh yeah it's 60 something I, I believe yeah i think this is let, let's move on to the this because it ties into the strengths yeah i think you and i are very similar and Ana Karina and Nancy are very similar in many ways i'll tell you why so we love doing everything like we are learners and we yeah. get passionate about everything and Nancy always tells me and i think i heard this from Ana Karina the other day at your place Nancy always tells me like I wish I knew what my passion was. I wish I was passionate about comedy like you or about communication, about learning or reading and everything. Because I'm always like you. I'm always reading, learning. I yeah. want to do everything. And sometimes I do everything so I don't do anything. And, and, and then tell the story of how Ana Karina went to Miami for the first class. Yeah. Because she, had, she wasn't really – she was working in her 9 to 5. And there was nothing really that – sparked like an immense passion in her until this happened can you tell a little bit about the course in miami absolutely absolutely i um, i uh, yeah i always knew what i wanted i back then i was already started my business right so i always have this passion i try to to let it let, let it you know guide me and and so on but um yeah i saw anna i mean she loved her job she 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 loved what she was doing but she was kind of like lacking of something you know Trying to find that, as, as you said. So I tried many different things. One day she would be like, oh, you know, this girl is doing this flower. It looks so beautiful. So I went researching this, China. This flower? Flowers. Like first balloon, it was... No, 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 no. But first it was like flowers or anything that will get her into like something that gets her out of her job because that was her life okay. as well. So it was like, you know, what can be different? What can you get you into a creative side or anything different, right? Something that really gets your passion uh, going. So first you talk about flowers. So I, I invest, you know, I, I, I'm exactly <laughs> like you. I found the provider of this person in China, which was one that they was making the boxes for this person in Los Angeles. And I found the, a friend, I invited a friend, who, uh, her mom used to do flowers in Venezuela. She was in the city inviting to explain how the business works. And I mean, I, I did everything, but she, she never asked again. I, I made a logo for her. I, 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 There's a bunch of different things that happened, right? I bought up a domain, you know, like already was making the business, right? So, but the, it never, it never, it never um, uh, you know, She was didn't not, go to the next no, stage. No, exactly. So then well, another day, she, she tells me, you know, months later, oh, look at the, what this girl is doing. She's a very unique mosaics with balloons and so on. I was like, oh, let me see. So I saw the, the Instagram account. I dropped her at her job. I, I normally was working from a cafe, building my company when I left the, 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 the island. And I, and I had to do service to the car. So I said, okay, there's a staples there. So I, I bought a template that this person was showing just to sell a template uh, online. So I bought the template, I bought the materials. And then that was on a Friday. I said, hey, Look what I bought. Now let's 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 do this as a weekend project, right? Let's do it. And if you see Anna Karina's first Instagram post is a uh, uh, thing a number one that that we build with that mosaic, and she did it, wow. and that was the very first post that she did. Uh, and then she was like, "Oh my God, this is so beautiful! No one is doing it in Canada. This could, you know, people would buy this here because no one is doing it, and so on." So yeah, yeah I mean, let's let's maybe do another one. So we, we kept talking about that. Just a few days later, it's like, "Look what these girls is doing! You know, they're doing it in Miami. They're doing a training. Look at the beautiful things that they do. That's there's nothing here in Canada they do like that." I say, "Okay, let me see." I went, I bought it. <laughs> Uh, no, I sorry. I bought a ticket to Miami. I talked to her cousin and I said, "Hey, can you can you host her for a few days?" She was so happy that she was going to Miami. So yeah, of course. And then I told I told her, "Listen, uh, give me the the thing. Let, let's buy the ticket. Are you sure? Like, yeah, I'm sure. I, I'm you know, I stay with my kid. Don't worry. Uh, go, you know, take a Friday so you can go. And it was on a weekend or something like that. So you just have to take one day off. And then she went there. And these girls she are went amazing. To Miami to take the course, the, the training. Course. Yeah. So and then that. It's kind of like she had this sparking her happening, yeah. and there she just found a bucket of gasoline and that this close. <laughs> so she came back like, I want to do balloons. I want to do that. She, she was like on fire, and 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 it never stopped. Just from there, she just kept having that passion. So she she kept her job and doing that because I I, I have more flexibility. I help her a lot in the first two years, and then when I launch um, a Panda Porro, my current company, I start getting busier, busier, busier. So I start kind of like told her, listen, don't rely on me so much. Hire someone, train someone, have someone there. Even if you know the your even, income is a, yeah, exactly. Payment. 
if this is going to be sustainable, you need to have people to help you. You know, I won't be able to be there. And even, you know, now we have two kids. So at some point, someone have to stay with the kids. The other one doing installations in the week. So please find people. So she started hiring people and training them and so on. So that's what really gave it the confidence to know, okay, let's go for a store now. And I have the human resource to run it, even if not, wow. I'm not there. So now let's go for a store. And yeah, that's, that's how it's going right now. That's incredible. Yeah. Man. What a crazy story. The lesson of this story is we all need a, a husband like Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, man. Like all, 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 all kudos I got to Anna. Yeah, like she's Karina really is passionate. Fantastic. Yeah. And, and passionate. And, you know, there's a, I mean, the, the success from an outsider's perspective, obviously, because I'm not in the day to day, it's just been like astronomical where I'm so happy that you were able to put all these like insights and learning from past years, from failures, from challenges into this company, all the, all the, all the uh, wits that you got from past experiences to the point where. Now you have a, a an establishment, you know, you have a store, you have staff, and what I enjoy the most about your the the AK balloons is that now you're able to go on vacation. Because you know what? A lot of a lot of um start a lot of startups, a lot of small, business, small yeah. businesses, the person becomes just you don't work 9 to 5, you work 12 to 12 to 12 to 12 and yeah. you're never off to the point that when you're on vacation you feel guilty that you're not working you stop making money so of you course. stop because you stop if, making if the money. cake is not being done you cannot deliver you cannot make it exactly. so of course those two weeks that you left those two weeks you're not selling and therefore you have less money and you're spending more money on it yeah that's like, i mean that's one of the motivations because we really want to travel um yeah in i mean in my case uh, we've been talking about Anna's business, but the business that I, I built, I, I always wanted to build businesses that I can run from wherever I am, right? Like, so all, everything I do is more tech related. So, yeah. Um, it's about, you know, being able to run the business, even if I'm on vacation, if I need to do something, yeah, build the business as a business, have people to run it so they, they don't depend on Critical. me. But even if I need to jump and do something, it's from my computer. So I'm always thinking about businesses and everything I do tech, is normally tech related. The good thing about tech is that it has by nature leverage which means that you can automate and delegate lots of tasks to computers not all of them obviously but not like a small business where if you're not present you don't make money so if you can start to automate optimize and delegate tasks that you don't want to do especially the ones that you hate to do perfect so now i want to ask you quickly about the 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 weakness of the strength yeah. Which is a concept that was like revolutionary to me when you first, when you first uh, shared it with me. And I want to read to you my five strengths. Okay. So here are my five strengths that the Gallup report gives you. One, learner. Two, communication. Three, futuristic. Four, positivity. And five, discipline. Now, I'm going to read what each of them entails. It's just like a sentence or two for each of them. And Jimmy, after each strength, tell me, because Jimmy did a course, and you actually are very, very knowledgeable on the topic, to help us interpret, to help us uh, elaborate on these. Tell us what the shadow is, if you can find a couple of examples, and if you can remember any of yours and also give the shadow. So I'll, I'll say the first one on mine, learner. People exceptionally talented in the learner theme have a great desire to learn and want to continuously improve. The process of learning rather than the outcome excites them. So clearly, the the strength is, is and the advantage is very clear. You, you, you love to learn, so you learn a lot. What could be the shadow, the weakness of the strength? Okay, just before we get to that, let's explain what the shadows are. Yeah. And, and what happens is that every time you have a strength, you're really good at something. Normally, that means that you're that there's something. I said there's a negative side of it. That's what we call the shadows, right? So it's important to understand your strength, and that's super important. But it's also important to understand what are the shadows of the strengths because you need to be very aware of that and not taking the good things that your strength is doing. Especially because so, you assume that others have that strength, but others don't. So maybe you held other people to the same standards 
but not everybody is a is a learner, you know. Yeah, and I mean, for instance, a learner. You just say learner, and and I'm a learner too. So I <laughs> I like to be you know all the time learning or something. What happens is that sometimes. Uh, we like to learn so much and we go too deep is that we spend at the end too much time. Maybe we needed to a recipe. We ended up reading 10 recipes to be what's the best one of that and doing like a, a research and then, exactly. then we don't eat, right? Like, yeah. so what I go is, is it has to do with action. Sometimes we yeah. need to learn things, but because we need to put it in practice. So what happened to me and I have the, the, the same, so I have the, some weaknesses in that is that I love reading as well. So I, I, I read 10 books on habits and I haven't put in practice any of them, right? <laughs> So that's a big tro- that's a big problem. So people that are learning sometimes it's good. You have like a, a knowledge, you have a sense of it, you can talk about it. Um, but really, it's not really worth it if you if you don't really put it in practice. So that's something that you need to be aware of. That so yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, learn for sure. That's gonna make you feel for, you know, it's gonna fulfill you. It's gonna make you feel good. But just understand this is the shadow of it. So you don't you know you just, just keep reading like and me, learning. Just I, put it in practice. I but learned it, graphic yeah. design for six months. <laughs> To yeah. crop a picture, you might as well delegate it, you know? Yeah, but, but in that case, I don't think graphic design is your strength. Yeah. And that was the problem. So that, that's what normally happens, right? So you have your natural strength, which is this strength finder is going to help you get, right? Uh, and understand. But then there's some things that you're not really great at naturally. Yeah. So you say, okay, so I am a eight at learning. Right or let's say I'm at Ada Polish speak. It's natural, like I mean, I enjoy doing it. This is is great. So, uh, but then I'm a four in graphic design. You can spend the rest of your life doing training of graphic design, and at best you're going to be a seven. Yes, you will never be a ten at graphic design if it's not your strength. If you don't enjoy it. it. Doesn't matter how much time you spend 100%. training. Hundred percent. So, but you can be a ten in public speaking if you're already a naturally. And you keep learning, you Absolutely. keep studying, then you can be, you're better off being a, a 10 or something that you love and you're naturally are than just trying to bring. That's why, uh, that's the problem with education sometimes, right? We try to t- give all kids the same education and evaluate them the same when some kids are just better at art, some kids are, kids are better at math. And be, so, having it lower doesn't mean that it, it, sh- it shouldn't be bad. I mean, because that's not their natural strengths. But anyway, education system is a whole different conversation. <laughs> okay, the next one communication. People exceptionally talented in the communication theme generally find it easy to put their thoughts into words. They are good conversationalists and presenters. What could be the shadow? Um, I think that well, it's hard to find a shadow of that one. But they, they, I think you have to do with deal dealing with people that uh, are not like that. Yeah. Because if you find someone that, that is more shy or something, you know, if you're in a space and someone doesn't have the same level of communication that you have, then you feel drained or you feel that they're not paying attention or you're frustrated. So you feel frustrated. So I think that have to do with also, you know, may, maybe just understanding that some people are not at that level, right? And and definitely, yeah, and and, and can happen, and many times happen, and I've seen this many times from 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 great communicators that. You may be in a place where, you know, you want to, maybe someone want to talk, but they don't have the same, you know, you're very outgoing and very, you know, and then yeah. maybe you spend a, a 95% of the time talking, but they never felt that because they, that's not in the strength. So I, I don't know. You have to just be aware of that and with people that don't have the same level as you. I love it. Futuristic is my third one. Hmm. I think you're futuristic yeah. too. <laughs> People exceptionally talented in the futuristic theme are inspired by the future and what could be. They energize others with their visions of the future. <laughs> what could be the shadow? <laughs> oh, man. That, this is my, my most difficult one. That's something that I, I fight with every day. Because I told you, every time I'm in a place, I'm already seeing what is missing, right? <laughs> so I'm thinking what... And I, it's very easy to connect. That's what got me to, into NFTs and so on. But is that... For me, it's very easy to connect what's happening today and how it's going to look tomorrow. And many times, things that I thought and even I wrote then that those things happen. So um, you are five years in the future. Yeah. And that's great if you take action, right? If you take action and you build something. So like the, the company that I built, Panda my current company, and it's doing great. I knew that we were going to move towards on-demand training for the industry and so on. So I built something two years ago that now, you know, the industry is adopting. So it's good to have that skill. The problem is that many times it doesn't let you be in the present. 
So you are living... Don't execute in the present. Not executing and, and being in the present, you know? Like, it, it, sometimes you're just thinking five years from now, but you know, hey, man, you need to, we need to buy groceries tomorrow, right? Like, <laughs> you're thinking about how this, this idea is going to be a million-dollar idea, but, you know, you need to buy a grocery. So uh, just, uh, just starting, just putting your feet in the present is hard because you're always thinking on the future. And also, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, just, it's just hard. But I think I think executing is a big part of it because you may be thinking about when your IPO happens in five years, but you haven't even like started the the the, the prototype. You know, you haven't even hired a, somebody to code or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the example that I always give is the podcast. Yeah. I was thinking about a podcast. I had ideas. I had a concept, and I was already thinking about three years in, five years in, and then. Three months went by and I didn't do anything yeah, yeah, until yeah. I shared it with my wife. Yeah. And in like 22 minutes, she had bought the equipment. She had bought this. She had done the research. Yeah. and But she executes. Yeah. Now, we'll get into the quadrants a little bit. But okay, the next one, positivity. Po- people exceptionally talented in the positivity theme have contagious enthusiasm. They are upbeat and can get others excited about what they are going to do. What could be the shadow? Uh, again, I mean, not not being um, basically not not being able to read people that are not the same as you, and therefore you can drain people that uh, are not in the same level of maybe hype and positivity that you are. Um, so I think they have to do more with like you know self awareness and trying to understand yeah. what others uh, have, and also um, I don't know if you ever gone through that, but being in that stage of positivity all the time, maybe. People that navigate both sides, they know how to navigate a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, you know, people are, are too in the negative side. One positive thing, you know, means a lot. But maybe being in the positive side all the time, maybe one negative thing can really get you down. Uh, yeah. Just because you're living in, in the stage. Yeah. The other thing that can happen is I think if you see people who are not as positive and, and excited as you, you think that they're being negative. Yeah. But maybe they were just born with that face. And, 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 and that face, which is like neutral... Is them being positive, you know? So, so yeah, you, it's not a strength in them. Just, I yeah. mean, they're seeing the 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 the, the uh, half glass full all the time. It's not it's not in their their strength, you know. They, yeah. That's why they don't they don't yeah they don't they don't match with you the way you. Just I like to it. call myself a rational optimist because the worst thing you can have is an irrational optimist, where everything is feasible, everything is doable, yeah. <laughs> and then you say yes to everything, which means not everything is going to turn out well. Yeah. Okay, and the last one, discipline. People, ex- this is my fa- fifth strength. People exceptionally talented in the discipline theme enjoy routine and structure. Their world is best described by the order they create. What could be the shadow? That, that one is easy to see. I mean, what happened with people that are too disciplined, right? Is that the second you have to move anything in your agenda, that really Pisses, gets, them off. pisses you off. <laughs> like I, 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 I used to work next to um, a Japanese uh, sales director. I was doing uh, Latin America, which is doing Japan. And hey, Latin America, it's like changes every time. It's yeah. like a whole, but I, I just, that's my day today. I just used to say, oh my God, it's crazy what you're dealing with every day. You know, the Japanese student will book one year in advance. They will never change the start date. They will <laughs> come in one year to so organize. So it, it's great in a way. And they, you know, they navigate like that. But the second something happened, you put a, you know, something in the middle, then that throw them off. You know, like it's like, it's a problem. It gets them upset and so on. So yeah. being so structured and organized can, can happen have that you know i i find value in that it's not my strength being organized but something i want to what i, I want to bring a little bit up i don't i know i will never be probably as organized as you are yeah. uh, but i will definitely wanted to bring it just a little bit more because i know all the benefits of it i think the the key thing that i'm disciplined is what saves me from executing so let's let's talk for one minute about the the domains of the strengths so there's four quadrants as we said there's 34 strengths and these 34 strengths fall into four quadrants. That's right. And if your top five strengths all fall into one quadrant, then you may not be good at the other three quadrants. So I'll tell you what these quadrants are. The first one is executing. The second one is influencing. The third one is relationship building. And the other one is strategic thinking now in my case i have 
strengths in the my top five strengths, I have at least one in each quadrant, which makes me pretty balanced. Yeah. But I only have one in executing, which is discipline. And that's the one thing that helps me execute, that helps me do because I'm disciplined. Now, the hard thing for me is starting. Once I start, I'm good. But to start is what, what yeah. what's hard. So you may be like, you may have your top five strengths in executing and you'll make everything happen. But you may not influence a lot of people. You may not build a lot of relationships and you may not have a lot of strategic thinking. So it's actually really good to understand how how many of your strengths or if you're really biased, you're, you're really um, strong in one of these quadrants because then you're better off looking for a role in a company or in your own company that deals with these things. For example, what ends up happening is you have somebody in a company that is a really good coder, but because well, what happens at banks, they're really good at writing credits, which is what I did at Scotiabank. And then what people think is like, oh, you're really good at writing credits. So you're going to be the boss of the people who write credits. But that is not very good because the skill set required to manage people yeah. influencing and relationship building is not the same skill set that is required to write credits or yep. to be analytical. Yep. So if you if you have a lot, a lot, a lot of your strengths or your top five strengths in relationship building and influencing, you're better off being in sales or influencing people or building relationships, relationship management, then you're off at like being uh, in the strategic thinking side of the business. Yep. Do you want to add something to the... Quadrants? No, absolutely. I mean, this helps you to, even for your relationships at home, in the things that it needs to do, it helps you if you're building your company, if you're managing a team and so on. No, the, knowing these strengths from everybody will help you organize better. Because, yes, that's normally what happens. You have the accountant that is the best one technical, and then, you know, the manager left, so you put this person just because they have the, you know, you, you think this person can coach other people if they have yeah. questions but then this person only likes is to see an excel sheet it doesn't have to they don't like to talk to people doesn't yeah. have to be you know just project managing anyone so when that happens uh, then that person feels miserable because what that person liked was actually doing their thing in the computer yeah. and the other people feel miserable because they don't you know they feel this person is not there it's not there for them so um yeah it's, it's very important understanding the skills and uh, in my in my case i'm, I'm more on the strategic side um, I think like two uh, or, or three out of four. I don't remember my my, my, wow. my so are there. So it's good to thinking and connecting dots and uh, doing all these kind of yeah, things and planning about. and so on and futuristic. But then on the execution side, right? It's uh, it's where like oh my god, I need to spend ten hours on this when I'm already thinking the other things are going to connect. So um, I think you, it happened to you. You know your your wife is your producer, right? So now she got these th things going. She so executes. now it helps you. So yeah, it's just about finding the right people with the strengths that will balance yours, right? And then yeah, you keep going. Yeah, do this test. It's only twenty dollars. You can also do the sixteen personalities tests, which is um, zero dollars. And then there's also another one called the Enneagram, which is free as well. You have to answer some questions, and it really describes your personality. And based on this self-awareness, you can then look for roles that you're going to be inherently better at than others. And as a result, you're going to be happier because you're being good. You're, you're getting promotions. You, you feel fulfilled as opposed to being miserable because you're stuck in a role that you weren't made to be in anyways. Okay, now non-fungible tokens. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. NFTs, non-fungible tokens. And we're going to start with the myth. Why do people think that these are just overpriced digital paintings or whatever? What What is an NFT? If we, we had to explain it to a 10 or 12-year-old, because we are all 10 or 12-year-olds in this space. We don't even understand what it really is. So, what is an NFT? Okay, so a non-fungible token. So, let, let's go with the word fungible because that was a word that I have to look into the dictionary to understand what it was, right? Yeah. So, uh, it, fungible is something that you can replace for, for another item. 
uh, that is similar. If you go to bo- go to the market tomorrow and buy a banana for ten cents, you know you can go tomorrow and buy another banana for ten cents, right? It's the exact same banana. Um, it doesn't really. There's nothing unique about the banana, right? It's always the same price. Nothing really changed between. If I give you, um, a, 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 ask you for twenty bucks and tomorrow I give you two tens, it's exact same value, same price. There's that's the, all things that are fungible, so they're easily interchangeable. There's nothing different uh, among them. When they're non fungible, that means there are those are things that you cannot really replace. If I unique. give you, they're very unique. So if I give you, um, I don't know, a baseball that was the one that hit the home run of the final series and is signed by uh, Derek Jeter, that you, you cannot go to the store and buy the same ball. That's something that happened there. So it's something unique uh, about that. And that happened with art. Um, and we're going to move from art to, to the digital art. Is that um, if you have a Picasso, there's no two Picassos. Even if Picasso did different frames, that that was a very unique one that he did. There is no nothing else um, that is the same. So the problem with R in real life is that how do you know that's actually a Picasso? You know, really certifying that something is unique and real um, when it's so easy to fake that happened with you know this very expensive uh, clothing and, and, and purses and shoes that you know they they get the knockoff in in China. Um, so the um, Certifying that it's original is extremely hard. So what happened with the non fungible tokens and the blockchain is that now it's easy because, you know, blockchain allows for non-centralizing, allows for transparency, allows for tracking. So Okay, what is, what, what, sorry to interrupt, what is blockchain? I have no idea. Blockchain is a technology that um, basically is allowing the decentralization of so many different things, you know, like the economy, uh, finances, um, interactions, and so on. So normally when something is centralized, it means that if there's a social media, uh, let's say Facebook, it's centralized. It's in their service. They have access to that. They can change it. They can modify it. They can sell it. They can do everything. When it's decentralized, it's, you know, it's really not in a, in a, in a, in a central, um, uh, let's say, server. It's not managed by anyone in particular. It's just in a network of servers and, and computers. And so nobody can no one can hack it, it, no one can destroy it, no one can know. You can always know what happened with that wow. transaction. So Was you can there always an inventor track of blockchain? It. Did nobody huh? did anybody invent like do we know who invented it? Uh, or has it just been evolving? It's been evolving, but I mean, I guess there were some people that, you know, first created it. I mean, it just really got popular with Bitcoin, which was the first one that Created like a coin, and then people start putting value to it. But it okay. was decentralized, so a, a Bitcoin is not a U.S. dollar managed by the Bank of U.S. That if tomorrow they decide to print yeah, yeah, twenty yeah. billion dollars in cash more than the the money really the, the values, um, it's okay, not really managed I, by anyone. I get it. So the 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 appeal is that this specific let's go with digital art, mm-hmm. this specific digital painting. Or this specific uh, moment that was digitalized when Michael Jordan hit the the last shot to beat the Utah Jazz in his sixth championship is unique, and it can be verified that it's unique. Exactly. And nobody's going to run with it because it's protected by blockchain that you know it's yours because exactly. it's in your digital wallet. Exactly. And because it's certified, there's no other you, one that's like mine. Yeah. So once we have this, how has it evolved in the past years? Because I now see people in yachts having NFT parties or something. And, yeah. and, and now it seems like it's, a, it's becoming like equity into a specific group of people that do something. And some NFTs have like perks where you can go to parties or concerts yeah that i mean we can i think we'll need a full episode to talk about nfts <laughs> but the 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 principal part is that you own a piece of art that or a piece of anything nft doesn't have to be art but it got popular by you know art so people say you know i, I can screenshot it sure you can screenshot you can screenshot mona lisa and print it in your house but that doesn't mean you own the mona lisa <laughs> right i mean it's really yeah the art has always been there you can print anything take a photo from a museum and put it in your house that doesn't make you the owner of a monet i mean this is it's really the fact that you can certify that you have a monet right yeah. and you can certify in the world so then um some people say but yeah you know why the face of a monkey so there's different things that are happening right now i mean there's again there's a bunch of other things but the most 
popular, what people are talking the most, have to do with profile uh, photos, right? Or profile pictures. It's um, like the, the monkey one. The monkeys, and there's a hundred different animals and robots Aliens. and things. like Exactly. So what, what happens is that there's a collection. So there's only 10,000 of those. There's yeah. no more, right, from that collection. Um, and what happened is that normally when they launch one of these projects, you got into a community, which is discourse the technology used for that. So you go there, people go there, so they, there's a community created. So people that are there, they talk about, you know, the things that they like and they don't. So they build a community on Discord. Um, Discord a, is like a WhatsApp. It's like a WhatsApp, but way, I mean, on steroids. I mean, there's so many things that you can on do in steroids. there. It's amazing. Okay. It's, uh, so, um, so what happened is that then uh, some people, if you're an artist, very well-known artist, you can do a series of 10, you know, if you're Banksy tomorrow and you do a, a you know, 10 posters, you will sell it there. And then people, you can either put a price or you can let people bid on it and then they will sell it. So that's. And you can only buy it with Ethereum. Uh, no, no. There's different coins that you can use. I mean, they, they could be Solana, it could be Ethereum, depending on the blockchain that you are. But the, the thing is that every time, one of the appealing for artists is that every time, let's say I bought one of those uh, Banksy posters, right? Yeah. Uh, and digital. And for they a have million, it. For a million dollars. For whatever price. Equivalent. Every time I said, you know what? It was only 10 the series. I was able to get in. Some another hundred people wanted to buy it. They couldn't buy it, so now I bought it. So now they want to buy it from me. So it's a secondary market. Every time that piece is sold, the original creator gets a ten percent, five to ten percent, depending how they say the contract of royalties. Wow! So from, they uh, so from the secondary market. So normally, if I buy, if I if I paint a, a, a frame and I give it to you, I sell it to you for a hundred dollars. If you sell it tomorrow for ten million dollars, I, I don't get anything. I don't get royalties for it. But with the blockchain, it allows you to track so you can charge in the secondary market every time. It happens automatically. Every time you sell it... You get a million people, dollars if it was 10 I, I get Well, I get $100,000. I get 10% of it. Oh, $10 million or $1 million. Yeah, exactly. Well, so uh, so yeah, that, that comes from the $10 million that you got. So you would only get $9 million. The Exactly. The person that is selling it, we we'll have to pay that commission to the, to the originator. Normally, like two percent, two point five to the marketplace, and then uh, another ten okay. percent to or five percent, depending on how they set the contract. So that alone is already interesting for artists, right? And then you have the community and, and for musicians and, and musicians and, and you know all type everyone. of artists. Yeah. So the so that that's one of the reasons why it's becoming so popular. Then there is the community, and then there is a utility. So many of these um, NFTs is not about the photo. The photo is just a key. And that key gives you access to the utilities. So now every time you go into an NFT project, you need to know what, what are the utilities. Oh, well, well, we have, you know, in the case of the most well-known ones, you know, we have 50 Hollywood star here, 20 singers from the top 100 billboard, and we have this and that. And we're going to do monthly jet parties and this and that. So they, I mean, they... They made so crazy amount of millions of dollars um, by selling the full collection. And then in the secondary market, people are buying and selling. So they keep getting money and more money, the, the creators of the NFT. So they use that money to give value to the community, right? Of course, the owners, they get a lot of money, but they really, the good projects, they really um, reinvest the money in the community. So they get the community going. The problem right now is that uh, because they become so popular, there are many, I mean, I would say most of them are saying, oh, we're going to give you, you know, like a passive income. We're going to give you this. We're going to do this and that. They sell the collection. They close the Discord and they disappear. Wow. So people buy the NFT. There's a lot of scam. Crazy amount. Crazy amount. How can we make sure that it's not a scam? Is there a way to be able to at least reduce the risk? Yeah, I'm, I mean, first things I will tell you is that... Um, and again, we could spend hours uh, talking about this, but you first will need to create an account in an exchange, Coinbase or Crypto.com if you're in Canada. Those are the two more, most popular ones. You buy cryptocurrency. Normally, Ethereum is the most popular one or Solana if you want to buy from the Solana blockchain. Um, and you put it into your digital wallet. That will be ideally MetaMask if you're using Ethereum. Yeah. So when you build this uh, a wallet, they give you a, like a 10 or 12 words. That, that's kind of like the code if you want to recover your wallet at any point. Yeah. Never save it on your computer. Save it no, somewhere. I printed. saved it on my computer. <laughs> okay, don't do it because uh, many people, you know, they get the computer hacked and then they find that, you know, one way or another one. Uh, so try to keep it, you know, outside of your computer. Then when you're going to get into an NFT project, do your due diligence find who's behind you know most projects out there the the team is not vox i mean vox it means that uh, they don't say who they are they don't have a nickname 
and they run with a nickname and they sell the project with a nickname. So you never some, know who's the real person behind so it. So some projects, they do tell you who, I, who they are, the real Very person. Very few tell you who they are. So because, I mean, there are some people that do it because they want to avoid taxes or they want to avoid, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, or if the project you know, flops, they can, you know, they don't, the people don't try to go after them. So, um, so mo I mean, not being Vox is already a red flag. Some projects are still successful with people that don't show their faces, but I would say, you know, right now how the what amount of camps are happening. So there's a terminology called rug pull, which that means that you get into a project, they rock, they, they take pull the, the rug, they from pull the rug and they, they run and then they, you, you're at the moment that that happened because the, the utility is why people pay so much for that NFT. Yeah. The moment that these people disappear, there's no one doing utility. Your NFT used to call one Ethereum. So now no one wants to buy it. So people start decreasing the price on the secondary market. So now people will buy it for you for 0 0.01 maybe. Because that's what they will pay for the photo alone, right? The photo, the art wasn't even that great, you know, yeah. to, to, to pay that much money. So um, when you get to Discord, you download, you get into the group, you will get direct messages from the people with the same logo of the group that you are that says kind of like moderator or whatever and they tell you oh we open the minting process the selling process right now do it here you go there you do it they just take the money from your wallet and they disappear so deactivate all direct messages oh deactivate all direct messages every time you get into a new group there's a way you click on the option settings and you say deactivate direct messages of people that are not my friends wow so that's the most common thing I've I've talked to people and I've said this to people, like uh, we, I'm in a group with some friends that are doing NFTs and they, you know, they bring more people that want to learn. And we say this to them and they still, uh, 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 they, do they, they thought, oh yeah, I'm in this group. I, I'm getting to the pre mint which is in a week, but I got like a half of the price and they didn't. And that money that they, they, they put, they got it. So it's the most common way of scamming right now. Wow. Yeah. And what's this that I hear where people are going to be able to... We'll finish. We, we're, we're we're in the final minutes here, but what's this thing where people are buying islands and apartments in in the in the metaverse or in in I don't even understand how to explain it. Where they're buying houses and they're buying, uh, they're gonna be able to, if they have it in like a, a digital concert where Justin Bieber will perform. You can only access the Justin Bieber concert online. If you have the NFT and it's like there's like a house in the metaverse or something and people buy it because it has the potential because it's next to the stage or I don't know. And it has the potential of selling media and, and, and sponsorships. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's the next stage for me. And that's what I'm the most interested in the is getting in the, in the metaverse. Yes, because uh, I mean, I have some ideas of things that I would like to build uh, in the metaverse, um, but I will NFT is the way of funding, you know, selling a project and giving benefits of that metaverse. It's a way of many metaverse are being right now funded, which is amazing. So that I have some ideas regarding or something I would like to do that in the future. Um, but the metaverse is basically a place where next time you do a podcast with someone, it's not going to be through Zoom. Maybe that person has the Oculus and the, and the two things, and then you're talking here and then you're seeing, you're doing your, your, your podcast um, in the metaverse. So now wow. you want to have that into... Um, what do you want to host it? I mean, do you want to look at an apartment? Now you can, uh, if you have an apartment in the metaverse, you can put all these posters there. You can put your NFTs to show off, you wow. know, I'm owner of this NFT. So I'm in some of those cool projects. I have some, some of my NFTs are valuing in a hundred thousand dollars right now. Oh, I own one of them. I'm a part of that community. I hang out with Snoop Dogg, you know, like <laughs> that kind of things are, uh, that's exactly what's happening. So next time, uh, uh, I think what's going to replace is more about it. Let's, let's catch up instead of just doing a, uh, WhatsApp call, you know, I don't see this, like people say, I'm going to work all day with these things on, I'm going to go study, just listening to a teacher with these things, I don't think that's going to happen, if you don't bring an experience that I don't think that's going to happen, um, but for social, socializing, of course, I mean, you can you can do it, some, there are some metaverses right now, it's like all about games, so let's watch some game with some friends, so you're there, and there is a, you know, they're there, you're hanging out, you're kind of like seeing them, and so on, so I think that's, that's what's happening, regarding the, the real estate, um, yes, it will depend on you know, what you're doing. If there's a lot of traffic in one of the metaverses because so many things happening, you buy a piece of real estate, you put a casino there, then people can get in there. I mean, there are so many different ways that you can monetize it. Insane. But right now, what the things that you and I can do 
is buy maybe an apartment or a house in one of these metaverses and then customize it as much as you want. And then, yeah, I mean, tomorrow you can do the podcast here. Or if you're going to have a, a Zoom call with a friend, they say, you man, just jump into this link and then it's going to be there. It's going to look and then yeah, you can show off your thing. So most of the things and the value that's happening on the NFTs is 100% to do more with um, the, the psychology and sociology than anything else. It's about how, you know, why you use that hat that is, you know, from Canada. You want to show people you're Canadian or maybe the New York Yankee. That's part of your identity, right? Yes. Um, uh, why you use this watch or that watch. I mean, everything you use, uh, it, it shows your identity. Yes. So that's why the NFTs is part of how you show your identity, what you show off about, what do you want people to see you, uh, uh, interpret you. That's why now... Uh, even Twitter and all the social medias are letting you connect. So that if you're showing a profile of a, of one of these apes that costs three hundred thousand dollars, already Twitter can have the mark that yes, this guy has this thing in his wallet. Wow. He didn't screenshot Fair. it exactly. He didn't screenshot it. He actually have this this, this freaking thing. So that gives you a different status. So yeah, so, and of course that. That's what makes people say, you know what, that is value that much. And if there is a million people that would like to have one, of course, it's offer on demand. It's as simple. That's why they cost that much. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. Oh, my God. Well, my friend, we reached the final question of the podcast. And every guest gets this question. It's called the champagne question. And it goes like this. If we were to meet a year from now, 2023, with a bottle of champagne... What are we celebrating in Jimmy Wataglia's life? Um, what are we celebrating? Wow, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, we're celebrating um, stability. Stability. Well, that was a long pause. <laughs> stability in what? In everything. Like uh, starting your own business in the middle of the pandemic and so on. That have taken a big toll in, you know, in so many areas of my life. So now things are getting better. So I think in a year of now, if I keep working on that, it's going to be stability with my family, with my business and so on. So, yeah, I think stability. That's beautiful, man. The yeah. stability. Yeah. Which means in many ways peace, you yeah. know. A yeah. And a lot of people think about happiness, but what they really want is peace. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this was a transformational interview. Entrepreneurship, the weakness of the strength, NFTs, blockchain, and hanging out with Snoop Dogg. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jimmy Bataglia and Stefan Dyer on the Stefan Dyer Podcast. Ciao, ciao. Gracias por escuchar el Stefan Dyer Podcast. Arrivederci, my people.